Let's go ahead and start. Are we on? We're on. All right. Good morning. Uh, happy to be here. Thank you, everybody, for talking. And now it's time to quit. So the I appreciate that. Come on in too. Um, it's good to be here again. I was out last week. I don't, um, I think it went pretty well. Johnny said he spoke on peace and that it was perfect. And so, yeah, and I thought, man, that you know, sounds pretty good. I'm not sure I could live up to that. So, um, so I appreciate him doing that, of course. And, but we were out to Disney World and having fun with three of the grandkids and, and getting worn out like crazy. And I'll tell you, if you ever decide to take my grandchildren to Disney World, don't go in September because it is still way too hot it was shockingly the heat index like 105 oh, good night the temperature would only be 92 but the humidity man i'm amazed i'm alive i'm blessed <laughs> so but it was fun and then of course we had a little grandson while we were gone he was about yeah he was about three weeks early it's not that we planned to be out of town when he came <laughs> just so you know my sisters already accused me of that but the uh but he said well he had to be in the uh, Nick you for a couple of days for oxygen, but he got home yesterday doing well. Great. So thank you for all prayers on that. They live in Oklahoma City, so they uh, what is that? That makes seven. We yeah, we are blessed with four granddaughters and three grandsons. So it's really a joy. Absolutely. Gradually taking over where we can. <laughs> so it's it's an interesting life God's blessed me with. It really is, and I'm thankful for it. So it's a great joy. So little Trevor's big brother is four. That's Wesley, and then his big sister is Elena, who's 10. And Wesley and Elena were around here for a while before they moved up to Oklahoma City. You may remember if you ever did kids stuff and preschool or children's worship, whatever. They've been back for BBS. So a lot, lot of fun. And that's my, uh, my second son, Kevin's children and his wife Caitlin so and they've been married a shocking good grief 12 years is that how long they've been married Daniel uh, they <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, they have they got married in April of 2012 which is hard to believe here uh, yeah they they well here like in town oh yeah okay. and I was blessed to do that wedding ceremony and that was uh, uh, an emotional time, no doubt, but it's a joy. So speaking of parenting and what sometimes happens, uh, the today's trivia question is name two wives of Esau. And I'll accept up to five names if you want to get wild. Some people say six, but you can name two and you get to say. The wives of Esau. Remember that Esau was in the Old Testament. Esau was a twin of Jacob, son of Isaac and Rebekah, which plays a role. And Esau sold his birthright. And did I hear an answer? Base math. Base math is one. How about one more? Right by it. Ada. Ada. Very good. Thank you. Ada, Basmath, <laughs> Judith, uh, Ohema, Obama. Or, or oh, holy, no, it's a, no, wait a that's the former president. That's oh, oh, holy, Obama. That's a, not the former president in my mind. Uh, but the, um, and so those, oh, holy, Obama, base math, base math also uh, had a different name uh, at times in scripture, but probably the same person. And then Ada, and then Judith. So let's look first at Genesis 26, 20, uh, 26, 34, excuse me. Um, when Esau was 40 years old, this is Genesis 26, 34. When Esau was 40 years old, he married Judith, the daughter of Biri, the Hittite, as well as Basemath, the daughter of Elon, the Hittite. So what was the problem with marrying Hittites? The two are not supposed to be joined. Anyway. Right. Now, this was the new nation of the Hebrews, and the Hittites were Canaanites. And the Hittites were the people that God was going to drive out of the land. So what other famous Hittite is in Scripture? Uriah. Yeah, Uriah, the husband of Bathsheba. Leading many to believe that Bathsheba was probably not Jewish uh, because her husband was Uriah the Hittite. 
he was probably a proselyte Jew because he fought for the nation of Israel and fought valiantly, in fact, up to the point he was murdered through David's plan. But the, uh, but the Hittites played a big role in scripture, and Esau married two of them here. And of course here, uh, just for the connection of, uh, let's look at verse 32. I won't get into the whole of Imelech story right now because it's a different tale, but uh, Isaac's servants came and told him about the well they had dug. We found water, they uh, reported. This is after conflict with the uh, people of Gerar, the future Philistines. So they named it Sheba, uh, and that's why the name of the city has been Beersheba to this day. And of course, we just mentioned Bathsheba, uh, because this region was named after this well, Sheba. And so if you look at a map, if you were to consider that, the area that they were living in at this time, Gerar, Philistia, on south into the what we would now call the Arabian Peninsula, goes down to Yemen, and that's where modern-day Yemen, not back then, modern-day Yemen is thought to be Sheba. And so that was the area that the... Uh, the Shebites were from Bathsheba, probably, not necessarily. And then the Hittites were uh, Canaanites who had also moved down this area at times. Because Esau, Edom, ultimately occupied what we would call modern day Saudi Arabia. And so the Edomites and the Esauites are the same because Edom was Esau, or Esau was Edom. All right, so uh, Genesis 28, because I say you could name two of five, and those are two, Judith and Basement. Let's look down at um, Genesis, oh, and did I read? I can't actually remember if I read verse 35. They caused Isaac and Rebekah great anxiety, great misery, great tension. We might also read sometimes that uh, they were a source of bitterness. So he had married outside his clan, and so then if you want to know about the motivation for that, Genesis 28, 6, Esau saw that Isaac had blessed Jacob and sent him off to Padan Aram to find a wife there, which was the people of the Hebrews, because that was where um, Eber was from, who was the original Hebrew, who was the great, great granddad, or great, grand, great granddad of Abraham. Uh, so, uh, he sent him to Padanaram to find a wife there. As he blessed him, Isaac commanded him, you must not marry a Canaanite woman. Jacob obeyed his father and mother and left for Padanaram. So then Esau realized that the Canaanite women were displeasing to his father Isaac. So Esau went to Ishmael and married Mahalah, the sister of Nebaioth, who was the daughter of Abraham's son Ishmael, along with the wives he already had. So the next wife was Mahalath, I don't think we named her a man ago because I couldn't remember that name. Uh, but Mahalath was the daughter of the Ishmaelites. Went to Ishmael, ma married Mahalath, the sister of Nebeoth, and daughter of Abraham's son Ishmael. So the daughter of Ishmael, and therefore the cousin of Esau and Jacob, right? Because Ishmael and Isaac were half brothers. And then, uh, so this was that generation. So he married uh, Mahalath to make, basically to make uh, Isaac mad. So usually not a good foundation for marriage. Uh, and then over at Genesis 36, what follows, 36 one, what follows is the account of Esau, also known as Edom. Esau took his wives from the Canaanites. Ada, the daughter of Elon the Hittite, Oholibama, the daughter of Anna, and granddaughter of Zibion the Hivite, Another Canaanite, of course, just say he took his wife in Canaanites. In addition to Basemath, daughter of Ishmael, sister of Nabath. Now, Basemath and Mahalath are apparently the same, is what I was mentioning a minute ago, that there's some debate as to whether they're five or six. And then if we go on down to these sort of names of uh, Esau's sons, verse 10. Uh, I won't name them there, but notice the end of verse 10 says the son of Esau's wife wife, Bethsemeth. Then uh, verse 12, these were the sons of Esau's wife, Ada. And then verse 13, these were the sons of wives, Esau's wife, Basemeth. It does name Basemeth twice. 
So that's why we get, how we get to five, maybe. Maybe there are two base masks, maybe a Mahala in there. <coughs> and then verse 14. Um, let's see, I missed one somewhere here. Ah, yes, at verse 10, there was also the son of Esau's wife, Ada, and then the son of Basmeth. And then down at 14, the sons of Esau's wife, Aholibama, uh, which I'm sure is pronounced differently, but I'd like that. And then the daughter of Ana uh, bore J.S. Jalem Korah to Esau. These were the chiefs among the descendants of Esau. You can read that if you want. But it goes on down to basically be that these were people that occupied the south part of um, the, what should have been the land of Canaan. Remember, the Israelites never conquered all the Canaanites, never drove them all out. Part of this may have been from some of the sin of Esau of combining peoples. You know, they by marrying Canaanites and having children, he created a half Jewish, half Canaanite uh, population. And so uh, they, they were the thorn in the side of many of the Israelite kings, including David, who had wars with them. And um, then eventually, interestingly, their, their roots trace to the Romans, to the Italians, to the Southern Europeans. And so if you think about the occupation of Israel during the time of Jesus by the Romans, that actually had connection to Esau and the Edomites, which I think is really an interesting thing too. Because if all these people had followed God, there wouldn't be all that need for, you know, the Savior Jesus and all the main things went on. Of course, God knew all was going to happen and had the master plan. But it's really interesting that if we just follow God, it's amazing what could be simpler, right? So it's part of what we'll be talking about today in James 2. So we're at James 2. We made it into chapter 2 fairly deep. I believe I read verse 1. And so we'll be at James 2. I'll read one again, and we're going to really go forward from there, like all the way into verse 2. Uh, so, my brothers and sisters, do not show prejudice or favoritism or division. Uh, maybe different interpretations. Mine says prejudice. And then, uh, just to mention, uh, last week we talked about the different term. Partiality. Partiality is the other one. If you possess faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ, for if someone comes into your assembly wearing a gold ring and fine clothing, and a poor person airs in filthy clothes, do you pay attention to the one who is finely dressed and say, you sit here in a good place. And to the poor person, you stand over there or sit on the floor. If so, you have not made, have you not made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil motives? So, <coughs> excuse me. Or to choking. I thought that we'd discuss a little bit just how appearances can be both deceiving and um, expected, I would say. You know, I've heard much of my life that we go to church in our Sunday best, right? And there are certain expectations I think we have to dress up. I think people usually dress well for a wedding, usually for church, usually for a job interview, uh, usually for, say, a graduation or something like that, when at other times that's all, you know, by the wayside. If day-to-day -day tasking is normal, we don't necessarily dress differently. And I personally think, and I've always thought, and of course I'm here on tie today, as usual, the, uh, but it's a habit of mine because I think we behave the way we dress. And so I think it's interesting that this is sort of an underlying issue that not only do we pick on people maybe, or, or think differently, depending on how somebody's dressed, but I think also, to some degree, people act differently the way they're dressed. I think, personally, if I did yard work this morning and came to work, yeah, excuse me, came to church in my yard work clothes, I suspect, you know, first of all, nobody could tolerate the smell. But <laughs> second, I think it would just be a whole different view on me from all of you and from myself. And I'm not saying we have to have our visitors dress up well. I mean, I don't think that's the case at all. But I think there's that, that air of expectation that we have because we're people. 
And what God's really saying here is let's look at the soul, not the person, because when we look at the person, that's an inherent flaw. Yes, uh, several of the district courts in the Metroplex uh, have a standing court rule that you must wear a jacket. Answers. And it always was stipulated that uh, beforehand it would say, yeah, because of respect for the court or for the judge, yeah. the people who are uh, working, that is their outwardly show of respect for, for the court. And that's it's a secular. That's uh, really part. interesting. And so it's, they're not looking on the inside, they're looking on the outside. Uh, so every attorney in our office would have a spare jacket for a witness that right. might show up dressed nicely, case. but not in jacket. Not in say, oh, here, I know it doesn't match, but that's really interesting, but where? is it? Yeah, you know, those things, world pervasions, you know, are, are really interesting. And I think it, it does interfere with how we think about people. I mean, I don't have any doubt that if I were a first time visitor here and showed up in my yard work clothes, I don't think I'd still be a member here, frankly, because I think people would think I was a little wacko. And I think, I think that's a little strange, but I also think there's that degree of respect for the group that I'm visiting, because ultimately this is the group that's home, right? Yes? I have a friend who's not in here today, but- Thank goodness, <laughs> tell me, this tell is the time. Her, she purposely does not dress up on Sunday. And I mean, I, I truly believe that, you know, there's an expectation that maybe we should, you know, when I was raised that way, that we yeah. should, you know, I think we all were, yeah. But she yeah. purposely dresses a little more casually so that guests who come and do not maybe have on their Easter finery don't feel out of place here. And I admire that. Yeah, I think that's a very valid point, honestly. I think, appro <laughs> yeah. I think that approachability has a lot to be said for it. Um, you know, I, I mean, I've actually considered like not wearing it which would be really radical and really good. <laughs> the problem I ran down, I'm so used to putting on a tie that I've been shredding a bunch of trees in our yard from the damage in March, May and everything. The hardest thing is keeping the tie out of the shredder. <laughs> <laughs> but, it's, uh, but it's just so much a habit that I just put one on. And I think that, um, I hope that's not a barrier to people, but I've thought about that. Because I think that it can be, yes? Um, I used to work in executive health placement uh, uh -huh. company, and they used to, the, the executives that would come and use offices in our place, they used to have them dress up just like they were going to work, even though they weren't going to meet with uh, employees, employers, but just so that if they were on the phone, having phone interviews, mm -hmm. it was definitely their belief that it changed the way they would approach that because they were dressed so it's definitely their belief I think it, from. yeah, I think it is really an interesting conundrum for us because you can't separate the physical side of being human from the, the fully, from the spiritual side. I'd love it if we could. I'd love it if we could just say, we are spiritual beings, we don't care. But I think there is that side where we also, I mean, being honest about it, I think we all want some comforts. You know, we want air conditioning. I love it. We want lights in here. We want, you know, various things to be comfortable for us because they're currently available. And frankly, I think most everybody can afford some clothes and some decent ones are probably, you know, some, everybody has a pair of decent clothes, it seems like. But I know I am sensitive to the fact that that's not always true. And I, I think it is hard for us to not pick out the, the difference in people based on appearance. And I think that's, I think James wants us to realize that we really should just realize everybody has a soul, and that's the bottom line, because that's hard sometimes. <laughs> I tell you, I, you know, I deal with people every day at work, and I think um, sometimes I wonder if they have ever had a mirror, or, uh, you know, a, or a friend or a parent who has said, you know, that looks absolutely ridiculous. And, but, you know, on the other hand, I also do anything I can to treat people equally. And, and it's, uh, it's a self-discipline. And that's what James is talking about here, is it's a self-discipline to realize everybody has a soul. And I think that's really a high value. Many years ago when I was in a youth group in, um, back in high school, we had a, a 
fellow youth minister in town who looked, uh, he was very young looking, though he was about 35, but he looked like he was, you know, 12 or 13. So we had him come in, uh, the youth minister and I collaborate, collaborated, uh, because this was a lesson, on having him come in in what looked like just trashy clothes and, uh, you know, just messy hair. And he, was, he just came in, kind of sat down at the back. And we had one of the girls from his youth group who was, you know, by outward appearances, very um, beautiful, I guess would be the right term. Very outgoing, very vibrant, maybe is a better term. And so we had them both come in at the same time, a little late into class and sit down. And it was amazing how everybody looked back at the guy and went like this. And everybody looked over at the girl and went like, here's a seat. You know, and it's really, uh, it was really a telling thing that there was immediate bias. And, uh, yeah, I think that's unfortunate too. It's a self control issue to take care of everybody. Norbert, yeah. The only thing I can say about this, you know, I've seen girls come here, you know, adolescent girls, teenage girls, and they're dressed like streetwalkers, you know. I mean, you know, and I think that shows them. Tremendous amount of disrespect, not only for yeah. I think the, the congregation, but for the Lord. You know, I know. think part of clothing is respect. I think that it's clear that some people know they're drawing attention to themselves with clothing or lack of clothing, as the case may be. And I do think that there are certain styles that I'm appalled by, honestly, because yeah. mostly they come and go, but sometimes they come and stay for too long, and. Uh, it's a it's a real challenge. It's a huge challenge because I think you know the immediate uh, response is somebody if you say something like "How about you wear a little more clothing next Sunday?" is "Oh, you don't like me. I'll just go somewhere yeah. else." And you know they they know that. I mean, it's a little bit of a confrontational side of things. Um, I think that outward adornment, whatever that is, clothing jewelry who knows what is always going to be an issue for people to deal with and i think it's hard to me it's just common decency you know yeah. I mean, why would you dress that way when you're coming right to worship the lord yeah I mean, and i think that's a fair point it's, it's, i think since we are to humble ourselves sense. before god and be respectful yeah. yeah i also think honestly it's hard for you and i because we're not women and I think the clothing options are very different for women. Basically, our clothing option is pants and shirt, right? And that's, you know, it's a little different, I think, when there are different options, too. I remember when I was in high school, you know, the girls, if their skirt was too short, well, they, yeah. you know, they had to get on their knees, you know, had to beat down so, so many inches With, off the floor. Yeah. Well, and, you know, that's what's led to modern day uniforms in schools yeah. and such. And, we had dress codes when I was in high school, and you know, almost everybody did whatever they could to try to subvert that. And uh, you know, it that's a hard issue too. It should be a matter of the heart, as with all of Christianity. I think that you just have the heart of what a Christian should be. And it's um, it's very interesting. I've personally observed in some uh, through the years. I used to coach a lot of basketball and such. There really are groups that uh, are into modesty properly, in my opinion, and groups that just don't seem to much care. It kind of tends to follow family lines. And so it's a taught issue, too. It boils down to the parenting. It often does, yeah. And I think that was really true. Uh, when when I'd see people from a lot of different families in, in athletics, so it's just that, you know, it's just self-control. That's really it. That's what James is talking about here. So then, when he says, uh, let's see, let me read 20, uh, verse 5 again. Did I get down to 5? No, I read 4. All right, let me read 4 again. That's what I'm looking for. So, it, have you not made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil motives? And I think that really, that phrase is kind of an interesting one about evil motives. Because that's really just saying not godly motive. It's, you know, there's good and there's evil. And that's kind of how it, it comes down, uh, you know, the truth of it. So, uh, don't be motivated by evil. Be motivated by godliness. Listen, my dear brothers and sisters. 
Did not God choose the poor in the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom they promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor. Are not the rich oppressing you and dragging you into courts where jackets are worn? Uh, do they not blaspheme the good name of the one you belong to? So that's kind of interesting, too, because he's making such a generalization of the poor and the rich and saying basically the rich are a bunch of sorry people and the poor will inherit the kingdom. And I think that's not the point he's making, but it is just see the soul for the soul. Excuse me, I'm almost thinking about choking again. <laughs> Maybe. <coughs> Excuse me. So then we get into the more challenging, I think. Verse 8. But if you fulfill the royal laws expressed in this scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing well. So let's think about that for a second. The royal law, so that'd be godly, right? From, from our king, essentially, a royal law in scripture, which I think is really an interesting comment because I don't think there was a lot of scripture when James wrote other than Old Testament. And loving your neighbors yourself was the teaching of Jesus. So I think what he means is godly word. I think we use scripture, but I think in the way of being godly from God himself, you shall love your neighbors yourself. Now, you know, we've talked about that before in other sessions in Matthew and such, talking about how loving your neighbors yourself is to be their soul as, as, as it being as important as your own. And I think... That speaks volumes to how we should realize we're God's creation and loved by God. Because if you don't believe you're loved by God and honored and precious to him, you can't really love your neighbor. Because if you love your neighbors, you love yourself and you hate yourself, then that means you hate your neighbor. So it's really, again, a self-discipline to realize as God's creation, God loves us and wants us to be his. So the royal law expressed in scripture, you shall love your neighbors yourself, you're doing well. But if you show prejudice or bias or partiality, all those terms, you are committing sin and are convicted by the law as violators. For the one who obeys the whole law but fails in one point has become guilty of all of it. For, and I wanna make sure we keep reading here, for he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. Now, if you do not commit adultery, but do commit murder, you become a violator of the law. Speak and act as those who will be judged by the law that gives freedom. All right, so think about that. What he's saying is, look, if you have bias or prejudice, you're sinning. If you sin, he already told us the consequences of sin or death. And so... If we choose that path of sin and death, then we're not showing the way that we should live as Christians in the world, right? So why we bring up the example of adultery and murder here? What? Yes. I, I'm thinking it's, James is talking to, and his main audience seem to be Jews mm -hmm. who are accustomed to the law, when right. I start with the Ten Commandments, and I could see possibly that there's a carryover, and okay, this new thing that uh, Jesus has talked about, and now that James is, that it's not just a checklist of, of love your neighbor, okay, I, I feel like that I do, but it's the heart issue Absolutely. that the Jewish, possibly the, the way of they're accustomed to their faith and religion, uh, didn't really look inward as much as it was the outwardly things yeah, of checking the list. Yeah, it was what the neighbor wouldn't notice, right? As opposed to the heart. And so this goes back to the fact, you know, that I've said each week, I think, I think James was at the Sermon on the Mount. I don't think he believed in Jesus yet, but I, this is so much the teaching of Jesus at the Sermon on the Mount. Was that you've heard it said, don't murder, but I'll tell you, whoever has hated his brother has killed him you know, in his heart. And then it says, you've heard it said, don't commit adultery, but whoever lusts after someone in his heart has committed adultery in his heart. And so I think what he's helping us to realize here is, and helping the Jews specifically, is to realize that it's a matter of heart, self-control, intent, desire to follow God. It's not a matter of 
saying, hey, I, you know, I may not like the poor people and I may pick on them. I may make fun of them. I may not help them out with anything they need, but I haven't killed them. And that's, that doesn't count, you know? <laughs> it, it's not the heart of Jesus that would say, you got to love this person because they're a soul created by God. Yeah, I think similarly, in a sense, he's using, sorry, the over-extrapolation of a couple of big ones about don't commit adultery and don't murder because most people are probably not willing to do those things because they're, you know, they're a little more noticeable to other people. But if you hate the poor person among you, that's not as noticeable. And I think that, again, speaks to let's have the right heart for the soul because God knows that intent. You may not walk up to him and kill him, but you may be killing them by your attitude toward them uh, in terms of their spiritual future. So I think it's really important that we realize the big sins are big sins, <coughs> but the mistreatment of a soul is a big sin, and that counts too. Speak and act as those who be judged by a law that gives freedom. So that would be a new thing too to the Jews. And again, you know, you're right, Barry, that this was written to the Jews who were scattered throughout the, the you know, he wrote it to the tribes of the Jews who were scattered. And for them to realize that the law brings freedom, I think would be incredibly averse to what they had always learned as Jews. Because their thing was always rules. And when you move from rules to freedom, it's a big deal. You know, I think that happens to us as people, as kids, we just follow rules. You know, you have your don't talk in class, don't cheat from your neighbor or whatever. And over time, you have to integrate that into life. Of here's how I'm going to treat my fellow soul. And here's how I'm going to treat people around me. And here's how I'm going to pursue doing what's right. As opposed to just follow some rules. And that's all a part of Christian maturity. Like Robbie was talking about this morning. Very big part of it. So the law gives freedom. Very interesting. Maybe part of that freedom is if you love others as you love yourself, you realize if God loves everyone and we're all in this together, that brings kind of a sense of freedom too. For judgment is merciless for the one who has shown no mercy. You know, I really like the way James is very direct. I think it's really remarkable how he's willing to say, like, hey, we got, you know, the law can give freedom, or it does give freedom. We should treat everybody well. And then he says, you know, and by the way, if you're merciless, uh, the judgment, judgment is merciless for that person. So he reminds you, hey, these are the right things to do. But also, watch out, because if you don't do them, well, the wages of sin is death. Or the wages are. The wage of sin? The wages of sin. Yeah. Well, let's go with R there. Okay. So judgment is merciless for the one who has shown no mercy, but mercy triumphs over judgment. And I am so thankful for the mercy of God. I think it's incredible to realize how much mercy God has for us because day by day, I think most every person has a sin feature in their life because we're people. And it's amazing how that mercy is. And the fact that we can die to ourselves, be raised in Christ, filled with the Spirit, dishonor the Spirit by being still involved in sin, but yet still God says, hey, you're mine. There's no con condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. As long as you remain His, you get to keep receiving mercy. And I think that is an amazing gift. That is not a human type of a gift. That is a godly gift. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but does not have works, can this kind of faith save him? So, uh, shifting gears a little bit, we're going from physical outward appearance to how we consider someone's soul that he just talked about, to not just upholding the, the rough tenets of the law, but also having the right spirit of the heart. And now he's going into the faith then. Uh, works discussion. So remember that the Jews were super big on works, right? And I think that a human tendency is to be super big on works. I think we would love for everyone to be able to bring a tally of what works they've done and make it simple that we then could say, hey, then you're doing these things right. 
that's what jobs are based on usually. That's what school's based on. That's often what, you know, almost any aspect of our life intersects with is rules. And when we get to the faith, that's the, the big reason for why we tend to have works. So if someone claims to have faith, but does not have works, what good is it if someone claims to have faith, but does not have works? Can this kind of faith save him? If a brother or sister is poorly clothed, and lacks daily food, going back to that prior section, I believe, and one of you says to him, go in peace, keep warm and eat well, but you don't give them what the body needs, what good is it? So, you know, that's, I think that's the easy way out, frankly, is to say, boy, I hope things get going better for you. Really do. That'd be fantastic. I hope you land a job, you know, but what are you doing to help them in that process? So, uh, if you say, go in peace, keep warm, me well, but don't give them what the body needs, what good is it? So also faith, if it does not have works, is dead being uh, by itself. So that, you know, that issue is that we have works all through our life that we try to live up to, but the motivation for those works shouldn't be try to live up to them. It should be, this is what God wants of me, so therefore I respond. Norm, do you think because... The, the verse just prior was the mercy, mercy triumphs over judgment. Do you suppose this is James' way of defining what that mercy looks like? I think that's actually probably very accurate. That's a good way of putting it. That the faith responding or works responding to faith is how mercy, mercy works. Operates. Yeah. Instead of, yeah, I bummer, I'm really point. sorry that this is happening to you. Yeah. See you down the road. Right. It's, you know, I think about the example of the Pharisees that Jesus would bring up at times, like, uh, you know, the widow, the praying before the widow might, the uh, widow prayed about her mites and gave them and such. And the prayer was all about how awesome he was, you know, spiritually. <laughs> I, I think about this where, you know, by faith, we could say, man, we are the awesome people of God. We got figured out and perfect. And if we do nothing to help our community or our families or our people around us or our spouse or whoever it is, then it's broken. And that the response, the mercy, should be that because we've received mercy, we give mercy. Absolutely. And that's a big part of our works, I think, is to because we've received faith, for, through faith, we know we've received forgiveness and mercy and grace, that we should absolutely extend that forgiveness and mercy and grace. So, um, let me read that again. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith, but does not have works, can this kind of faith save him? So I think he's, you know, rhetorically asking that question because obviously you got to have a responsive faith. If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacks daily food, one of them says to you, go in peace, keep warm and eat well, but you do not give them what the body needs, what good is it? So also faith, if it does not have works, is dead, being by itself. But someone will say, you have faith, and I have works. Show me your faith without works, and I'll show you faith by my works. That verse always reminds me of the people that say, but I'm a good person. I don't need God, I don't need Christ, I don't need church, I don't need Christian fellowship. I'm a good person. And I think what's lacking there is that works by themselves without faith are a problem. It, or it will never get you anywhere. It's okay to be nice when you want to be nice. I mean, that's probably a good human virtue. The problem is that's a human virtue, maybe, but not a Christ-like virtue. The Christ-like virtue is realize God's in charge and therefore extend by faith the works that bring about the mercy, forgiveness, and grace, that people can see that. And so, uh, that's why I think he means that I'll show you faith by my works, because what he does is for the right reason. You believe that God is one, well and good, even the demons believe that, and tremble with fear. Another very famous verse, I think, from James, there are a lot of pretty famous verses from James, which is interesting, but... I think that phrase, you believe that God is one, well and good, even the demons believe that and tremble of fear. You know, I hear from people at times, most notably people I interact with at work, they'll, they'll say something like, oh, you, you know, you're a Christian, 
right? And I'll say, yeah, and they'll say, well, you know, I believe in God and I do good things. And I'll think, that's not the same. You know, it's being dead to yourself and alive in Christ. I most notably hear that from Muslims. I think that's a very common phrase among our Islamic population is to say, oh, I believe God is one. I have a patient I think I've mentioned before. Every time he comes in, he says, "You," uh, or he says, greetings to you, fellow son of Abraham. And, you know, because they, the Ishmaelites are sons of Abraham. And the uh, ultimate, you know, Arab line to Muhammad uh, traces that same line. The problem there is twofold. One is they don't believe in Christ as the Son of God. But the reason they don't believe in Christ as the Son of God is that, and they don't believe in the Holy Spirit, is that they believe God is one. As it says here, it's interesting, I think, where he said, you believe that God is one, well and good. They believe that God is God, but not God, the, what we would describe as the Trinity. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. They do not believe God could send himself as a sacrifice for people. They believe that they follow through the writings of the prophet Muhammad. They follow rules to get there. And so if you ever, you know, in general, know either Muslim or really it applies to Mormon uh, people too, that they are kept so busy by works it's ridiculous. I don't know if you've ever really known a Mormon family. You might have close friends who are Mormon. What do they do all day long? Uh, well, uh, besides just wearing the special underwear, yeah. that they can then go into the temple on, on right. Sunday. They have special garments, special it's dress. Special garments, special dress. Uh, then they prepare themselves each day for that actual um, experience of praise. Mm -hmm. um, and then, well, of course, the, the, the prayer, but they, if you're not a Mormon, if there's someone who they've come in contact with, that their daily act is to expose them to uh, the Latter-day Saints. And if they are a good person, but they really, but the Mormon thinks they should be Mormon, they pray for their baptism to be that they, without knowing it, that they are now a Mormon because right. of their... Uh, prayer and petition for that person who's in, yeah. on this earth as a non if that's what you're well asking. yeah because that's a big part of it is that they pray for it and be baptized in the Mormon church not into Christ which is a huge distinction but also and maybe you're alluding to it there what they are is very busy all day the Mormon people the Mormon families I know the kids get up and do you know they wash all the stuff from the church from Sunday the ward the local congregation they get, they wash all the, you know, tablecloths, gowns, whatever, in the morning. They go to school, they come back after school and they clean the building. And then they go to their, um, you know, their educational time as Mormons, which suddenly I forget the name of. And Catholicism is catechism and I can't think of what it is, Mormonism. And then at night they have duties at home and they are so busy, they can't figure out what else is going on in life, you know? And, <laughs> It's really interesting, and I feel similarly with the Islamic people I know who have their five set prayers a day, no matter what. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you could look at that and say, boy, that's a really nice faith-engaging type of a deal. You know, I believe in reading Scripture every day to keep you engaged, and I think it's good. I think it's the right thing to do. But I also think if you do your prayers because you have to do your prayers, or else other people will suddenly notice you're not there doing your prayers, because they do it very publicly. They kneel toward Mecca, which is a little bizarre too. And um, and it's very ritualistic. So both of those are very ritualistic and not very blood slut faith guide our works because of what is needed around us. Mm -hmm. And I remember I had an employee in the past who was a Mormon and her comment was all her life she had been kept so busy with Mormonism that she couldn't ever talk to other friends about their church or their church camp or their Bible class or whatever. And she was amazed when she got kind of out and away from the home, how many wonderful Christian people there were because she had always been told they were sort of the substandard people. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting because she had always been so isolated. It's almost, uh, well, it's fair enough to say, I think it's cult-like to keep people very busy 
very involved with only their own group. And sorry, I have a fear that, oh, if you get out to these other people, you won't, you won't be able to handle that. And, you know, we have freedom in Christ to be able to go out and honor people by serving them. And I think that's a very interesting difference. So when I read, you believe that God's one, well, good, even the demons believe that and tremble of fear. I believe that we all know, all people, that not just Christians, but people. I think because we're made in the image of God, we know very well that God exists because we're made in his image. You can't ignore the fact we're different than a tree or an animal or an insect. And it's an important distinction. So therefore, I think we yearn for God because we're made in his image. And some people find that God in something very different, whether it's, you know, alcohol or a false religion, uh, following a prophet instead of following Jesus or one of uh, those many things or a group, you know, a group that's sort of their social club and, um, and just they don't realize sometimes they're yearning for God. But I think we all yearn for God ultimately. And I think that's the root, the same that Jesus said, you, know, you can't serve God in mammon, uh, is that you, you are going to serve somebody. You're, you need to choose to serve God. So I think that is what he's talking about there. But would you like evidence, you empty fellow, that faith without works is useless? Now that's another kind of interesting and direct statement from James, isn't it? I'm at verse 20 in chapter 2. Would you like evidence, you empty fellow, that faith without works is useless? So, who's the empty fellow? The person who is doesn't have that inwardly desire that looks at people as uh, fellow souls in creation, that they are an empty vessel that's without the, uh, that the spirit but they have outwardly the actual the works, the things that they want to do, uh, the what people see. But that, yeah. that spirit hasn't filled it. Absolutely. Inside. So what the empty fellow is the person who's going through the motions, but doesn't understand that there's a reason to have the motions, right? That's kind of in line with the sermon sort too. It's interesting how often that aligns. But um, I think the empty fellow is that person who says, oh, I do good things. I'm a good person, you know? But they, yet there's nothing there that is convicting them of being dead to themselves and alive in Christ. Because what we get, you know, as Paul so eloquently tells us, but with the Christian walk, we have faith, hope, and love. The greatest is love, but right there with it are faith and hope. And if you don't have faith and you don't have hope, and you possibly don't have any love there because... I think love springs out from faith in taking care of people. Then you have a very empty, you know, well, I'll do the right thing. This will be the right thing to do. Okay. But there's no hope there. There's no, you know, this is going to allow for growth in, and for spiritual pursuit. So was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac his son at the altar? You see that his faith was working together with his works, and his faith was perfected by works. So he showed his faith, he grew in his faith by the work of planning to go out and sacrifice Isaac to just follow what God said. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Now Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him for righteousness. And he was called God's friend. So because he believed in God, he, uh, through that faith process, is realizing God was in charge. That faith that grew him tremendously, I believe, by realizing God had said, I'll bring you a son. And then he said, take that son out there and sacrifice him. That, you know, is also a prelude to the sacrifice of Christ by God himself, I believe. Excuse me. <clears throat> but I think it really speaks to the issue that because faith caused Abraham to respond, he then grew in that faith, and that is that pursuit of righteousness. Yeah, I get the question from time to time. What do we mean when we say pursue righteousness? And I think it just simply boils down to try to be committed to Christ, try to be Christ-like. Now, I don't think we'll, pers per uh, we'll achieve it because Christ himself said, you know, be perfect like I'm perfect. 
but he gave us the means of that by the blood of Christ. But I think he means being perfect like I'm perfect to be like me. And that's what he ultimately, ultimately allows us to do is by forgiving our sin and allowing us forgiveness in his blood, he allows us to be like him. And he is called God's friend, a very critical, beautiful piece of uh, how God called Abraham beloved. He is God's friend. That is, that's a phrase that I think is timeless. If you're somebody's friend, if you're God's friend, that is incredible. You see, the person is justified by works, not by faith alone. And that may be the key word there, alone. Not by faith alone. We have faith. Therefore, we have works. We do works because we have faith. Similarly, was not Rahab the prostitute also justified by works when she welcomed the messengers and sent them out by another way? For just as the body without spirit is dead, so also faith without works is dead. So I always find it interesting when Rahab's brought up because that's not uncommon in Scripture because she responded by saving the spies. Now, I believe God could have saved those two spies without Rahab. The reason Rahab exists to us, and in reality, the reason she was present in Jericho at the time was to bring about that response that ultimately showed that the people who had faith in God and said, hey, we can conquer this land of these giants. And to do that through a woman, and maybe also through a prostitute, or innkeeper, as sometimes the translation is. Um, and, of course, Rahab was in the lineage of Jesus when we read the genealogy, too. So it's really valuable that we see that she did something by faith. She heard about these, these two guys that came in from the Israelites who were encamped outside of the nation and said, hey, I think there's something here we should pay attention to. And that's the big part. If she had said, hey, you know, I think you two guys were from God and I hope it goes well for you, that'd be really different. That would not be that responding with works to the faith issue that she knew God was in charge. So I think that's a, a big lesson for us too. Just as the body without spirit is dead, so also faith without works is dead. So you don't want to be dead in the terms of the not having a faith that allows for the works that come forth from it. You know, I think similarly, Jesus absolutely could come and taught everything he taught and never healed anybody. You know, if he had just looked to the the man on the mat who's crippled, and instead of saying, take up your mat and walk, if he had said, hey, you're in the spot God wants you in right now, so just be okay with that, and I'm going to go on teaching. That would be very different impact. We could learn the teaching side, but we wouldn't learn the compassion and and response to faith side. And I think that's really a, a high value too. What other questions, comments before we close out? Anything else? Okay. Pretty quiet group out there, me choking. <laughs> now, I always appreciate all the, the questions and thoughts. It, it's uh, a joy to me to get to be here for any lesson. And I think this... Uh, the lessons in James are just so today, you know, so practical for us today. And I think that's, you know, going back to why James was placed where it was originally in Scripture and then adjusted a little and such, was that this is really hard teaching for people who considered themselves to be God's people, the Jews, but yet didn't want to necessarily change anything about their life because of God's people. Because we're God's people, we should absolutely change things about life. And that's the response that should be there. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for each soul. Here we pray we'll be mindful of all souls around us, that you are the creator and you've created them. You've given us the chance to uh, intersect with them. We pray that we won't uh, pick on them or feel uh, more righteous than them, but we'll just realize they're a soul in need of a savior too. And uh, we're in a time where it's really a challenge with politics and with the world uh, and with people trying to pick out small differences among themselves and say everybody needs to be like me. We want for people, we just pray we'll see, that people should be like you, 
not like humans and that we should die to ourselves and live in Christ. We're also at a time where things like abortion are just publicly paraded as uh, an entire platform of a political party. And uh, it just breaks my heart to see people rejoice over the killing of babies. And we just pray that you'll, you'll allow us opportunities to be witnesses for you and for truth and for a, a proper faith that responds with the right works of taking care of the souls in need around us. And I feel like, Lord, that if, if more people just turn to you, it'd be so much simpler. And um, if Christians would just do what Christians should do, it would just be such a blessing to this community. So we, we just pray we'll fervently pursue you. Please bless our week, and uh, we thank you so much again for the opportunity to get to study and look forward to next week. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you.